Well, it's just a privilege to be with you this evening. I want to thank you for coming out to hear what we have to say. And I do want to talk about astronomy this evening. And some of you probably have an interest in that. Some of you may, may not. But we all should have at least a little bit of an interest in it because astronomy is one of those areas, among many, that uh, secularists have used to challenge the Bible. They, they'll, use, they'll, they'll say, well, you can't trust the Bible because, and they'll give what they think are astronomical facts that challenge Scripture. But I want to show you that really when you understand the Bible and when you understand the universe, you're going to find that the scientific evidence lines up with what the Bible teaches. We're going to see that the secrets of the cosmos confirm Scripture. And I'm going to show you five secrets of the cosmos this evening. We're going to see that the glory of the Lord is revealed in the heavens. We're going to see that the Bible is right when it talks about the basics of astronomy. We're going to see that the Bible is right when it speaks to the age of the universe. We're going to see the Bible is right when it talks about the uniqueness of earth. And we're going to see that the Bible is right when it talks about distant starlight. So basically the theme to take home would be the Bible is right. How about that? And let's just jump right in. And of course, this is important because a lot of people are on the path to hell because they've been taught that you can't trust this, allegedly for scientific reasons. It's not the case. Let's take a look at some of these. We're going to see that the Bible is right when it speaks about God's glory being revealed uh, in the universe. The Bible tells us in Psalm 19.1 that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of His hands, a figure of speech indicating that the universe has something to say metaphorically about, about God. And I think there are a number of different ways in which it does that. I'm just going to talk about two this evening, the size and the beauty of the universe and uh, how those confirm biblical creation. If God wanted to impress his creations, well, the universe would certainly do the trick. It's, it's incredibly beautiful and incredibly large. And of course, there are many other ways in which it declares God's glory. The, the clockwork precision with which the universe operates. The power, the energy in the universe, and so on. But we'll just talk about the size and the beauty. We'll start with the moon, which is relatively small. The moon is only about the size of the United States in terms of its, uh, how far across it is. If you could put the U.S. in the same distance as the moon, it would cover about the same, about the same area. Here we have a mosaic image of the moon taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's taking high-resolution images of the surface. And the moon really is beautiful when you look at it in a small telescope. In fact, just uh, a few nights ago, I was out looking at what well, the moon was out, but I was looking at various objects through the telescope, and it's really stunning. And especially the moon when it's in a first quarter phase, when you get the line right down the middle, and you can see the shadows of the craters, it's stunning. It was really beautiful. And uh, most people are very impressed when they see the moon for the first time in a small telescope. It's quite stunning. And some, sometimes the question I'll get will, will be, well, can you see the flag where the astronauts, you know, that... <laughs> well, not quite, but uh, considering it is the size of the United States. But it's interesting, we now can see, we've now taken images that are so high resolution, we can actually see the places where we landed on the moon and the remains of the spacecraft. Remember the Apollo mission, they they left the bottom portion of the spacecraft, that leg-like spider-looking structure, to save fuel. They just just launched the top portion of it. We can now see that. Here it is. We're going to zoom in on a section of the moon. Zoom in quite a bit. And there it is. How about that? That little uh, thing that you see there in the middle, the lunar module right there, right there. And by the way, there's, there's that little black line you see going over there to the crater and back, you see that? Those are the footprints of the astronauts that they left as they walked over to that crater and back. Isn't that interesting? 40-year-old footprints, and they're not going anywhere because there's no weather on the moon, so they're going to be there for quite some time. And you can see some of the other instruments, too, that they left on the surface of the moon to do various experiments there, so... And uh, you can't see the flag for that one because it, it blew over when it launched on Apollo 11. But the, on the other, all the other sites, they, they learned to move it away before. So the, the blast from the takeoff knocked it over on, on Apollo 11. But all the other flags are still standing, interestingly. The scale of the cosmos is just as amazing as its beauty. And so again, we start with the moon, and that's in first quarter phase there, where you can see the shadows of the craters. And it's a lot of fun to look at the moon with a small telescope, especially in this phase, because the way the light and shadow works, it looks so three-dimensional. When it's full, it looks flat as a dime. But when it's in that first quarter phase, your brain somehow can figure out from the shadows of the craters that it's, that it's a sphere and not just a circle. That's really beautiful. Compared to the size of the Earth, though, the moon's pretty small, relatively speaking. 
Uh, the Earth is a beautiful gem, and the one planet I've never seen in a telescope, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Saturn, oh, Saturn is just a gem in a telescope, and that is one of the things I got to see the other night as I pointed the telescope up. That's beautiful. And usually the reaction that people get when they see Saturn for the first time in a telescope is usually, wow, it's stunning. It's small, it's a tiny little thing, and yet the true size is much bigger than the Earth. Saturn is about nine Earths across, and that's just the planet. The rings extend out much further. Those rings are made of, a, of, a, of, of a millions, trillions even, of tiny little moonlets that orbit around Saturn's equator. So it's quite beautiful. Uh, the sun is quite a bit bigger than Saturn. The sun is about a hundred Earths across, a little bigger than that. It could hold over a million Earths if it were hollow. And the sun is basically a stable hydrogen bomb. It's fusing hydrogen into helium in the core, and that, that's a very efficient power source. The sun puts out as much energy uh, in, in a second than a billion major cities would use in a year. And uh, you, know, you say, well, isn't that wasteful? Well, not for God. <laughs> He's got plenty to spare. The sun is what we call a main sequence star. That basically, main sequence stars are sort of the normal type of star, and it, um, it, it's, if, if they're in main sequence, they obey a particular formula such that if you know the mass of the star, you know everything else about it, its color, its size, its brightness, everything. The sun obeys that rule, so it's a main sequence. Uh, most stars are smaller than the sun. Red dwarf stars are the most common. They're just everywhere. But we tend not to see them because they're not very bright. They tend to not shine very brightly, and so most of the stars that you see in the night sky are the exceptions that are actually brighter than the sun, and there are some of those as well that are brighter and bigger. For example, Mintaka, one of the stars of Orion's belt, is uh, quite a bit bigger than the sun, as you can see there. These are all at their true scale, but there are stars that are bigger than this. This, is, of course, is a blue supergiant. We have uh, white supergiants, uh, Canopus which I had never seen before moving to Texas because it's too far south to see where I'd lived previously, but I can see that now. You can see it in February, in the, um, a little after sunset. And it's a white supergiant, quite a bit bigger than the sun. But stars get even bigger than that, like Antares, which is several hundred suns across, and the sun is a hundred Earths across, so you do the math and it's really big. <laughs> really big. Red supergiant, that's about as big as they get, that, no more than maybe twice that size. Stars often come in clusters, like this beautiful globular star cluster. Again, this is one of the things that I looked at the other night through a telescope. Uh, later, later on, I'll tell you about a book that I've written that shows you how to find all of these things in a telescope. Or some of them, of course, you can see, some of these things you can see naked eye. You don't need a telescope at all. But I'll show you how to do that a little bit later on. Beautiful structure, probably 100,000 stars in that one cluster. And there are hundreds of these globular clusters that, that orbit around our galaxy. And I, I love it. It always makes me think of that verse that God calls them all by their names. You know? We don't even have, we couldn't even count that. That's incredible. Some of my favorite objects in the universe are called nebulae. A nebula is singular. It's nebulae, plural. It means cloud. And they're not a cloud of water vapor like in our sky. They're a cloud of hydrogen and helium gas. Those are the two lightest elements. They're the same stuff that stars are made of. But stars are compact hydrogen and helium gas in a sphere, a relatively small sphere, only a few hundred times the size of Earth, whereas a nebula is much, much larger, spread over a vast region of space. And if there are stars nearby, they'll heat up that gas and cause it to glow. And you get beautiful coloration in them. They're really stunning. Some nebulae are quite a bit smaller, and these are called planetary nebulae. They're produced by a single star that's ejecting gas, often out the north and south pole of the star. And so you have that, that they call that a bipolar planetary nebula because it has that two-lobe structure that you see there. So there's, with a star in the middle. So it's a dynamic artwork of God. It changes a little bit over the centuries. And there are lots of planetary nebulae. Some of them have that two-lobe structure. Some of them are round. And it could be the ones that are round are also bipolar, but we might be looking right down the barrel. That's a possibility. We don't really know. We can't get another angle on it. So it's tough to, it's tough to say for certain. One of my favorites is the Ring Nebula, because it's one of the first I learned how to find. It's just exactly in between two stars in, in the, the constellation um, Lyra, and it's a beautiful little glowing smoke ring there in space. It's so weird to see this, and, and, you, and you don't need an expensive telescope. You can see this in a very small telescope under dark, dark skies, get away from the city lights. But uh, it's beautiful. 
It's so strange, because most of the places you point a small telescope, you'll see stars and stars and stars and stars. And they're beautiful, but they're, they're just stars. There's one little spot where you will see a glowing smoke ring. It is so weird to see this little cosmic Cheerio hanging there in space, suspended on nothing. Really strange. And so there's a white dwarf star in the middle, so that star has, has died, so to speak. It's collapsed in on itself and ejected that nebula in a rather, it's a rather gentle process. All of these things that we've looked at so far, all of these stars and clusters of stars and nebulae are in a much larger structure, a galaxy. And a galaxy is a collection of perhaps 100 billion stars, some more, some less. Uh, and sometimes they wrap around themselves in this beautiful spiral structure. Other galaxies are elliptical, but often they're spiral like this. See, it used to be that astronomers thought that this was small and, and nearby, but we now know that it's, a, it's another island universe in its own right. Really, really stunning. All kinds of galaxies in the universe. There are galaxies of tremendous beauty. There are galaxies of tremendous ugliness. <laughs> there are galaxies with large, mysterious arrows next to them. <laughs> We still don't know what causes that, as a friend of mine used to say. We have, we have galaxies that have rings of stars surrounding them. Isn't that stunning? We have galaxies that look for all the world like flying saucers. That's a real galaxy. They call that the Sombrero Galaxy, and you can see it in the spring in springtime. In the, it's at the southern end of the Virgo supercluster. It's really pretty, and you can see that dark dust lane, too, that, that covers the light from the stars behind it. Galaxies in the process of collision... And people have said, well, is that a problem, you know, having galaxies collide like that? Not for us. <laughs> Actually, the stars would just pass by each other because the space between them is enormous. You have clusters upon clusters of galaxies, we now know. These are not individual stars. You can tell because they have that fuzziness to them. That tells you you're looking at a galaxy with hundreds of, hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of stars each. As we go even deeper into space, you find galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. Isn't that amazing? This is about as far out as we can look, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And every one of those points that you see there, it's not a star. That's a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. Even those tiny little ones in the background, those are galaxies at tremendous distances. It boggles the mind. And this is in a tiny little region of space, somewhere in the Big Dipper. It's tiny. Amazing. That's the power of God. All this spoken into existence. He just commanded and they stood fast. That's what the Bible teaches. That's power. That's amazing. And I love the way the Bible describes the creation of all these hundreds of billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars each. It's, it's summed up in this little phrase, he made the stars also. <laughs> so it was just so easy for God to make all these hundreds of billions of stars. Well, it was. He's God. It's not a problem for him. All made in six days. Actually, most of this was made in one day, the day four. If you think about it, God, made, God took five of the days working on earth, making it right for us. He took one day, day four, and made 100 billion galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars, as if to say, you know what would go really good with an earth? How about 100 billion galaxies? Let's throw that in too. Why not? That'll impress my creations. It impresses me. Well, the Bible certainly is right when it says that, God, that uh, God's glory is revealed in the heavens. What about the basics of astronomy? Things that today we'd, have, we'd all have to agree, like the, the, the roundness of the earth, things like that. You know, the Bible talks about those things. It talks about the spherical nature of the earth. In Isaiah 40, 22, the circle of the earth. You say, well, that might mean a flat circle, but Job 26.10 says that God inscribes a circle uh, at, on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. And that only make, that's what we call the terminator, where light stops or terminates. And that only works on a sphere. And it's on the waters because Earth's surface is mostly water. So it, it's referring to a spherical planet at a time, interestingly, when most people did not believe the Earth was spherical. Isn't that interesting? If you look in most astronomy textbooks, they will generally cr credit Pythagoras with being the first to come up with the idea that the earth might be round. And then Aristotle is usually considered the first to prove that that's so. But Pythagoras is 500 BC, Aristotle's 300 BC, Isaiah written long before that, 700 BC. Job, we think, is around 2000 BC. It's interesting, isn't it? The Bible was describing the circular nature of the earth, the spherical nature of the earth, in a time when most people, the experts of the day, did not believe it. Isn't that interesting? I wonder if it was tempting for them to compromise and say, well, 
Yeah, the Bible indicates the spherical world, but it can't really mean that because our best experts indicate that it's flat and supported by turtles or whatever it is. Hmm, something to think about. I don't know that they did that. I'm just asking the question. Earth is suspended in space. In Job 26.7, it says that God hangs the earth upon nothing. That's a wonderful description of the nature of gravity, isn't it? The earth literally hangs on nothing. Wonderful description. Might have been hard to believe when it was written. Because again, Job, 2000 BC, but early Greek uh, experts taught that the earth was a flat disk and floated in water. And wouldn't that make more sense? We, think, we see things float in water, but how can you hang something on nothing? That's ridiculous, except, of course, it's true. <laughs> God got it right. How about that? People say the Bible's not an astronomy textbook. I know that, but when, it's the Word of God, and when it touches on astronomy, it's right. God knows how the universe works. He made it, after all. I believe the expansion of the universe is taught in Scriptures as well. It says that God stretches out the heavens as a curtain, spreads them out as a tent to dwell in, indicating that God has apparently made the universe a little bigger than it was when he first created it. He stretched it out. And that might have been hard to believe when it was written. Again, Isaiah 700s BC, something like that. Because up until, really up until the 1500s, 1600s around there, most of the scientific experts thought the universe was static and eternal. They thought it was unchanging and could not be changed. It would have been really hard for them to believe it's expanding, and it certainly doesn't look like it's expanding. If you go out tonight, it looks big, and you go out tomorrow night, it looks about just as big. It doesn't look like it's been stretched out. But it was in the 1920s that some astronomers came along, and from measuring redshifts of galaxies, they said, it looks like like, like the universe is being expanded or stretched out. How about that? something that the Bible speaks of millennia earlier. Very interesting. Now, some people have said, well, wait a minute, Dr. Lyle, does this, does this mean that there was a Big Bang? Because if you got all the galaxies moving away from each other, doesn't that mean that they all go back to a point? Does that mean that they exploded into existence 13.7 billion years ago? And the answer is no. Just because something's getting bigger doesn't mean it exploded into existence billions of years ago. Some of you are getting bigger. That doesn't mean you exploded into existence billions of years ago. <laughs> Not at all. Apparently, God made the universe with some size, and he stretched it out a bit since then. We don't know how much. He doesn't say. But uh, there's no indication that the universe was ever a point, like the Big Bang folks believe. Some people have said, well, at least this confirms the Big Bang, right? Because the Big Bang, didn't it predict that the universe would be expanding? And lo and behold, observations show the universe is expanding. Doesn't that count as a successful prediction? And the answer is no, because the uh, expansion of the universe was discovered in the 1920s. The Big Bang idea, the idea that the universe came from a point, was invented in 1931 as an explanation for that expansion, a secular explanation, really. The inventor of it did believe in God, but he believed that science and God were separate, and he wanted to explain the origin of the universe in natural terms. So it's not a confirmation of the Big Bang, not at all. Conservation of energy and mass. This is a little more abstract, but I do believe the Bible teaches this principle, that the amount of stuff in the universe, mass or energy, Einstein tells us mass and energy are basically the same thing, measured in uh, two different ways. Uh, The amount of stuff in the universe is constant. It can't be changed. You can't make energy. You can't destroy it. You can only transform it into other forms. And we would expect that because the Bible indicates that no new material is being created today by God. God ended his work of creation by the seventh day. He's done with creation. And uh, nothing would simply pop into existence apart from God because the Bible says all things are made by him. Now, does this preclude a creative miracle? No, God can create new things. But for the most part, by and large, his act of creation, his work of creation is done. And so we'd expect that we wouldn't see new things just popping into existence from nothing. No new material is created, and God upholds what, he, what he's made. So you're not, you're not going to find stuff simply popping out of existence either. And these two principles together are what we call conservation of energy or conservation of mass. And we find that, um, lo and behold, that's exactly what the universe does. It's, it's consistent with the scriptures. Uncountable numbers of stars. The Bible describes the, Abraham's descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. A beautiful figure of speech indicating an uncountable number. And in some places it even says that, which cannot be numbered for multitude. That doesn't mean that God can't number them. God does number them. It means humanly uncountable. It's a great metaphor, wonderful description. It might have been hard to believe when it was written because you can see a few thousand stars with the naked eye. Even under ideal conditions, we think the maximum would be about 10,000, which is a big number, 
but it's countable. And then the telescope was invented, and we realized, oh, that Milky Way, that, that patch that looks like a cloud, that's actually hundreds of billions of stars. There's no way you could count that. You can't count to 100 billion in your lifetime. Can't do it. That's a wonderful metaphor. Do you get the point? Have we learned the lesson of history? Have we learned that when the, the experts of the day have disagreed with the Bible, the Bible has always turned out to be right? Have we learned that lesson? It's tempting for us today to say, oh no, we finally have outsmarted God. We've finally risen up technologically to the point where we understand way better than the Bible about how the universe was created. No, we ha- if, if you do that, you haven't learned the lesson of history. All the people who disagreed with the Bible in the past, they now have egg on their face. And if you want to avoid that, you better get on God's side. So, what I now want to do is talk about things where uh, my secular colleagues haven't quite caught up to the Scriptures. And one of those issues is the age of the universe. The Bible indicates thousands of years, right? Because it tells us God created in six days. It's clear from context those are ordinary earth rotation days because they're bounded by evening and morning, and they're in a numbered list. They're sequential because it says in, in six days God made the heaven and earth and all that in them is, indicating in the span of six days. So there's no doubt about that. And that's a few thousand years ago because Adam's made on the sixth day, and you can add up those genealogies that you love to read before you go to bed, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and you <laughs> add up those ages, and you find it's a few thousand years ago, something like 6,000 years, give or take a little bit. The Bible's very clear about that. In fact, the universe, the, the, the luminous objects in the universe, the stars, the planets, and so on, they're made on day four. They're actually a little bit younger than the earth, not older. So you can't, uh, you can't reconcile that with the secular view. But again, my secular colleagues say, no, it's got to be billions of years, and they need that for evolution. A lot of people buy into the millions of years without realizing the motivation for it really is to justify evolution, because you can't do evolution in thousands of years. You can't do it in millions of years either, but you get, you get my understanding. There's evidence, though, even today, that the universe is thousands of years old if people would bother to look at it. And you, unfortunately, you won't find this in many textbooks. It's really a shame. It's there, though. Excess internal heat of the giant planets. Jupiter actually gives off. It emits twice as much energy as it receives from the sun. It gets some energy from the sun, and it gives off twice as much. Okay? Now, if you think about that, it's, it, it's got to be losing energy. You can't, and you can't do that forever. You can't continue to spend more than you take in, unless you're the federal government, right? <laughs> well, that's, that's going to catch up with them, too, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, anyway, so Jupiter can't do that forever. It can't do that for billions of years. It would, have, it would be an icicle by now. It's kind of like a potato that you take out of the microwave. It's nice and warm. It's, it radiates that heat into space. It loses that energy, right? runs down. Jupiter's a much bigger potato. It can do that for a few thousand years. It's not a problem. But if it's billions of years old, it should be an icicle. The problem's even worse for Neptune, which gives off 2.7 times as much uh, heat as it receives from the sun, as much energy. How could it do that for billions of years? It just can't. It It should be cold by now. The magnetic fields of the planets. Earth, for example, has a magnetic field. You probably knew that. Most of you have a compass in your car or somewhere that tells you it points to north because there are currents in Earth's core that generates that magnetic field, and it actually protects us from radiation from the sun and and other radiation from space as well, so it's actually a nice feature for life on Earth. Uh, other plant, some other, other planets have them as well, some don't. But the interesting thing is plant, magnetic fields don't last billions of years. They just can't because that electrical current runs down and it encounters resistance. And so uh, we've actually been able to measure that and we find that the, the strength of the Earth's magnetic field has been dropping over the past century and a half. We certainly, we've been able to see that. And now we think it's, it gets complicated during the flood year because we think that the plates would have been pushed apart and that would have caused rapid reversals in the, in the um, uh, polarity of the magnetic field. But the total energy just drops. Even during the flood year, it just continues to drop down. It's an exponential decay as far as we can tell. So it's just dropping down since creation. And if you run it backwards, you find it can't be more than a few thousand years old. If you run it back millions of years, well, it's an exponential decay. So if you run it backwards, it gets really big really fast. It start ripping the iron out of your blood, and that's not good. It can't be, it can't be millions of years old, let alone billions. It's consistent with thousands of years. It really is. It's not just Earth, too. Some of the other planets as well. Jupiter has an enormous magnetic field. It would be bigger than the sun if you could see it. It's huge. Now, why is that the case? 
if it's really billions of years old. Why hasn't it run down by now? May I suggest it's because it's not billions of years old and it hasn't had time. The planets Uranus and Neptune. The planet Uranus is actually tilted on its side, so it, it rolls around the sun, so to speak, and the magnetic field is stuck in at a weird angle too, so the magnetic field would wobble as the planet rotates. Uranus is really messed up on a number of levels. It's very different than Earth anyway. Um, and that was something that wasn't expected by the, by the secularists. But the interesting thing is that magnetic field is quite strong. It's consistent with thousands of years. In fact, a colleague of mine, Dr. Russ Humphreys, who uh, he's retired now, he used to work for us at ICR, and uh, he actually predicted the, the, the strength of the uh, magnetic fields of Uranus, Uranus and Neptune before they were measured by the Voyager spacecraft, and he was right on, because he assumed they're 6,000 years old, and based on 6,000 years, here, here's how much they should have decayed, and he pr successfully predicted the magnetic fields of those planets. Isn't that interesting? And the secularists were way off, because they thought, well, they're billions of years old, the magnetic field should be decayed by now. Now, there's always a rescuing device, right? They'll say, well, there must be some kind of recharging mechanism that regenerates the, the magnetic fields in those planets, like a magnetic dynamo, like the alternator in your car, which is a pretty complicated machine. We don't find those uh, out in nature. And, and by the way, one of the predictions of that dynamo model was that the magnetic field would have to be aligned with the rotation axis, at least pretty close. Is it? Uh, no. It's not even close, and Neptune's is similar. It's stuck in the side. It doesn't even go through the center. It's really strange. So it's consistent with thousands of years of simple exponential decay. The recession of the moon. The moon is actually moving away from the Earth, due, and that's due to uh, tidal forces. The moon induces tidal bulges on the Earth, one on the moon side, one on the other side, by the way. People say, why does it do a bulge on the backside. Well, it's pulling the Earth's center away from, that, away from that ocean is how that works. And those tidal bulges, since the Earth rotates faster than the moon revolves, right? you've got the Earth spinning quickly, the moon going slowly. Well, those tidal bulges get ahead of the moon and then they pull forward on it. And the really weird thing is when you pull forward on something that's in orbit, it moves up, it moves out. That's a little counterintuitive, but if you've ever played with a gyroscope, you know that when things are spinning, it doesn't quite act necessarily the way you'd expect. But the moon is gaining energy as it moves away from the Earth, stealing a little bit of Earth's energy. Which means if you run the movie backwards, it would have been, the moon would have been closer to the Earth in the past, and if you run it back 1.4 to 1.5 billion years, they're touching. In fact, they're in the same location. So they, they can't be that old. And you say, well, that's a long time, 1.4 to 1.5 billion years, but my secular colleagues believe the Earth-Moon system to be 4.5 billion years old. So it's an inconsistency in their way of thinking. But it's not a problem for creation, because 6,000 years ago, the Moon was about 730 feet closer to Earth. Not a big deal, considering it's 240,000 miles away. Not a problem. Indication of thousands of years. So are comets. Comets are an indication that the solar system is thousands, not millions or billions of years old, because comets are made up of icy material. Well, that's not a problem. You got ice out in space. But then they come close to the sun and they get whiplashed back out. So they spend most of their time far away from the sun where that ice remains frozen. But then they come in and then they, when they get close to the sun, what do you think happens to that ice? Well, it gets, yeah, it gets vaporized and blasted out into space. And that's what forms a comet's tail. That's actually material being blasted away from a comet. So every time you see a comet, it's getting smaller. It's in the process of being destroyed. And uh, we're, allegedly, we're gonna see a spectacular one later this year, November, December. We should get a really good uh, pass of a comet. And that'll, that'll remind you that the universe is young because comets cannot last 100,000 years. We, we can see the rate at which the material's being blasted away from the nucleus there. We can calculate that. We know how much material's there. We know the rate. You solve for the, uh, the time, you find it can't last more than 100,000 years for a typical comet. Some of them even less than that. I've seen comets totally destroyed in one pass. In my uh, doctoral research, I used the SOHO spacecraft, which points directly at the sun, and it, it's got different instruments on it. One of them watches for comets that go around the sun and does other things with solar wind and so on. And I've seen comets that go back behind the sun, and that's it. They're totally obliterated, totally destroyed in one pass. They do not last millions of years. It's kind of like if you went into a sauna, it's nice and warm, and you see some ice cream cones sitting there just starting to melt. You know they haven't been there very long, right? Comets are the ice cream cones of the solar system. They're an indication of its youth. 
It hasn't been there very long. Again, there's always a rescuing device. Well, maybe there's this Oort cloud that generates new comets, a big comet generator out there in space to replenish them. But we've never seen that. We've never seen that. It's just a rescuing device. Spiral galaxies. Not all galaxies are spiral. Some are elliptical. But many of them are spiral. And spiral galaxies can't last billions of years because those spiral arms rotate. And it turns out the, the intersections rotate fast and the outer portions slow. So the inner portions are doing this, the outer portions are going slower. And if you think about that, that means that spiral structure would be becoming tighter and tighter as it gets twisted up. And it can't do that for a, you know, a billion years or more. If it, if it were one billion years old, it would be twisted beyond recognition. You would not see spiral arms. They just wouldn't be there. We can measure the, the rate at which it's, it's turning. And yet we find spiral galaxies everywhere that my secular colleagues believe to be 10 billion years old. That's 10 times the maximum of what they theoretically could be just based on the, the, the winding problem. And so I'd like to suggest it's consistent with thousands of years. Not a problem at all. You might notice that these spiral arms has a, have a little bit of a bluish color, because, and that's true. It's because they have a high, higher proportion of blue stars in them. And blue stars themselves are an indication of the youth of the universe, because blue stars are the hottest, most luminous stars in the universe. They, they expend their fuel very quickly. They also tend to be the most massive stars. They have a lot of fuel, but they burn it really quick. They're kind of like the SUVs of the cosmos. They got a really big tank, but they get very poor gas mileage. And so they, they can't go very far in time. They can't last very long. The, uh, the hottest, brightest, bluest stars can't last more than about a million years or so, maximum. That's not their true age, mind you. That's, that's the maximum of how long they could last. But we find them everywhere. <laughs> They're all over the universe. And so that's a problem if you think the universe is billions of years old. But it's not a problem at all if it's thousands of years old. And again, my secular colleagues say, well, obviously, anywhere you see blue stars, they must have formed recently. And so they believe that Stars are constantly forming. But I got news for you. No one has ever seen a star form. You'll read about it. And, the, you know, you'll find, you know, in the newspapers, but that's the only place you'll find it is in the newspapers and in the textbooks. You won't find it in space. As far as we know, it doesn't happen. And it, it's really problematic, too, to take gas from a nebula and compress it into a star by its own gravity because the gas pressure far exceeds gravity in a nebula. The gas pressure wants to make it expand, not contract. I'd like to suggest blue stars are just an evidence of the youth of the universe. The Bible's right when it talks about the age of the universe. What about the uniqueness of Earth? Is the Earth just a pale blue dot? Is it just another planet out there where the chemical conditions happen to be right for life? Or is it something that God created special? The, the scriptures indicate that God formed the Earth to be inhabited, and that makes it different than many of the other worlds in our own solar system and in the, in the rest of the universe. God formed the earth to be inhabited, it says in Isaiah 45, 18. Not a waste place. In fact, the earth is actually three days older than all the other planets in the universe because they're all made on the day four. It's when God makes the luminaries. The Hebrew word kokob would include uh, planets as well as stars. So uh, they're all made a little bit later. Earth's different. When we look at earth's neighbors, the moon... It's a wonderful world. I'm glad the Lord made it. It's enjoyable to look at it through a telescope. One of the astronauts who walked on its surface called it a magnificent desolation. I think that's a wonderful phrase for it. It has a type of beauty to it. It really does. But it's not designed for life. Not at all. It's, in a way, it's formless and void. It reminds me of maybe what the earth might have looked like before, uh, before God formed it and filled it, although the earth was water, of course. But the, the moon doesn't have that beautiful structure that the earth has. It's just cratered wasteland. Stunning in its own way, but not designed for life. What about the other planets of the solar system? Even if we just pick the ones that are most Earth-like, Venus, for example, Venus is about the same size as the Earth, just slightly smaller. And then we got Mars, it's a little bit smaller and further out. Venus is a little closer to the sun. Um, beautiful worlds, but they're not designed for life. Not at all. In the past, secularists thought maybe these, you know, maybe there might be life evolving on these planets. And they thought, you know, Venus being closer to the sun, that could be a tropical paradise for all we know. And they were free to speculate because Venus is permanently overcast. You can't see its surface. And so it's always nice to speculate unfettered by inconvenient facts, inconvenient <laughs> observations. 
And you will read in some of the older literature, you know, speculations of life on Venus and sometimes even the old sci-fis, you know, like Outer Limits and Twilight Zone and things like that. I still, I think it was an Outer Limits episode where William Shatner lands on Venus and there's these weird creatures and they got the weird music playing and so on. It's all fun, but I mean, it reflects the thinking of the time, really. That, of course, was before they measured the surface temperature of Venus and found it to be 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So, although there's no humidity, so it's a dry heat. But still, remember that when August rolls around, okay? And then we got Mars a little bit further away, a little bit cooler. It's, it doesn't have the right type of atmosphere or anything. I, I should mention, too, these clouds on Venus, sulfuric acid. So it's not, it's not designed for life. Neither is Mars. Mars is a little bit more hospitable, but it's, again, it's not designed for life. A poisonous carbon dioxide atmosphere It's very, very thin. Um, it just, it's not designed for life. No liquid water on it, as far as we know. So it's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? You got these planets too hot, that planet too cold, that planet just right, right? Earth right in the middle. It's not surprising from a creationist perspective, is it? Well, that brings us to a question then. What about extraterrestrial life? Now, the evolutionists would love to find extraterrestrial life. And there are a number of reasons for that. One of it is it would go a long way toward vindicating evolution. If Earth's just another planet where the chemistry happened to be right, well, there's probably other planets out there where the chemistry happened to be right. And so it stands to reason that life should have evolved elsewhere. They expect to find extraterrestrials. In fact, they have whole programs like SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. You've heard of this program where they point the radio dishes into space, listening, as it were, for uh, alien civilizations. They haven't heard anything, except the natural radio sources, of course. Well... Why all the hype, though? Why is it that they want to find these things? And, and, and would we expect that as creationists? I, and I'll admit, the Bible doesn't directly say that there's no ETs out there. I understand that. But I find that problematic in a, in a Christian worldview, don't you? To think, if, if, if there were Vulcans and Klingons out there, you've got some theological issues you've got to deal with, right? Because if you think about it, Vulcans and Klingons can't be saved because they're not related to Jesus. We're descended from Adam. Jesus is descended from Adam. That makes him our blood relative, and so he can be our kinsman redeemer. Right? We can be saved because he's our relative. That's why his blood counts for ours. The blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins, the Bible says. It was used as a symbol in the Old Testament. But uh, only Christ's blood can atone for sin because he's our relative. But uh, Lieutenant Commander Worf is out of luck because he's not related to Jesus, <laughs> and so he can't be saved. That's a problem. Well, why the hype then? Why is it that people really want ETs to be out there? Partly as a vindication for evolution. I've had, a number, I've had a number of opportunities to talk with secular astronomers. Why do you want this to be true? Well, there's this profound feeling of loneliness. It'd be nice if we weren't alone, alone in the universe. And, and maybe these, these alien civilizations would be advanced and they would have answers to the questions of life that we've been pondering. And maybe they'd have incredible medical technology and could cure our diseases. And maybe they've even figured out how to defeat death. If you think about it, that is a secular replacement for God, is it not? Because we're not alone in the universe, there's God. And we're designed for fellowship with Him. We reject Him. That need for fellowship is going to come out in other ways. God is the one who gives meaning and purpose to life. He's the one who has the answers. God is the one who can heal our diseases. And God is the one that has promised eternal life for those who would trust in Him. It's interesting how that need comes out in other ways. I want to... I want to suggest that that's perhaps why all the hype regarding extraterrestrial life and why secularists want to find it so, so badly. But it also brings up the question of where are they? In the secular worldview, where are they? It's called the Fermi Paradox. After the scientist who came up with this idea, he said, well, you know, if the universe really is billions of years old and evolution's true, happened on Earth, probably happened elsewhere, that makes sense. And so it probably happened elsewhere, at least in some places, before it happened on Earth. That makes sense too. The universe is billions of years old in their view. And so if it evolved somewhere else, and it stands to reason some of those would have become, become highly developed civilizations and would have become spacefaring and should have colonized the galaxy. But of course, the galaxy isn't colonized. So where are they? There should be many civilizations communicating, and we don't find them. It's, it's, a, it's a problem in the secular worldview, but it's a feature if you're a biblical creationist. It's what we'd expect. What about distant starlight? That's a place where the critics say, we got you here, because no way can you have thousands of years, given how far away those galaxies are. 
And we do find galaxies that are very, very far away, uh, billions of light years away. People hear that term light year, they think that's age, but a light year is a measure of distance, not time. A light year is about six trillion miles. It's far. So when we, when we hear about the universe being billions of light years big, that just means it's really, really big. But then you'd say, but yeah, but doesn't light take a year to travel a light year? That's usually how it's defined. And so, you know, these galaxies that are billions of light years away, and I think they really are. I think that declares God's glory that the universe is so big. And we see them, so obviously their light has gone from there to here, and it's supposed to take billions of years. Doesn't that prove the universe is billions of years old? I've had people say, well, that, you know, we got to give up the Bible for that. There's no way you can believe in biblical creation. And of course, <laughs> I mean, it, the objection itself is rather silly, isn't it? You can't trust in God's Word because we can't explain something naturalistically. But God's not limited by natural phenomenon, is He? I mean, how do we mechanistically explain the resurrection of Christ? If you can't, we say, well, if you can't, well, then God can't do it. That doesn't make any sense. That's illogical. And in any case, I think we do have an answer to this. I, think, I, don't, I don't think it necessarily involves supernatural activity because there, we do have uh, natural ways of explaining how God got the light here in thousands of years. It really isn't a problem. It's just people don't know their physics very well what it comes down to. I do want to point out that many of the proposed solutions that you've heard of, perhaps, just don't work. And and I'm I'm sorry I don't have time to go into a lot of detail on that. But um, just as as an example of that, the distances are not real. Some people have said maybe all the galaxies are just really close. They're all within, um, whatever, 6,000 light years. But that's just not realistic. The the methods by which we use to measure the distances of these galaxies are very good methods. They're good scientific methods. They're not based on evolutionary thinking. And creationists and evolutionists would agree on that. Some have said, well, maybe the speed of light was a lot greater in the past. And so the light zipped along and then slowed down, and we're just assuming that the rates have been constant. And that was a good thing to check, because sometimes evolutionists assume constancy of rates when they're really not constant at all. But in this case, I think there are good reasons to think the speed of light has been constant throughout time. It's actually, it, it relates to the strength of electric and magnetic fields and so on, and it's, it's doubtful that you could change the speed of light very much and have matter actually be stable. So I think there's a good reason for that. One of the ones that is really common is people have said, well, maybe God made the light beams already on their way. And there are aspects of that that I like, but I don't think that's going to work. And I want to show you just in a little more detail why this one is problematic. If you believe that God created the stars and the light beams already connecting them to the earth, and that has a certain appeal because God did make the universe mature. It was fully functional. Adam and Eve, he made as adults. They didn't need to grow to that from a baby. Maybe the light's like that got a certain appeal to it. But it requires God to create fictional images and movies. Let me give you an example of this. We have a supernova 1987A. If you would have pointed your telescopes at the large Magellanic Cloud in 1987 in January, you would have seen, uh, before January, you'd have seen a little blue star right there. Actually, a pretty big blue star, but it's far away. And so you see it right there. And then in uh, early in 1987, that star blew itself to bits, and so it became very bright as the energy was released from that exploding star, supernova. And that happened in one of the Magellanic Clouds, a satellite galaxy that's 163,000 light years away, which means in secular thinking, that happened 163,000 years ago. And you'd say, oh no, God just made a beam with a picture of that event in it. Then that means that event never happened. It was just a picture, a movie that God created in a beam of light about 6,000 light years out that finally reached Earth in 1987. If you believe in the light in transit hypothesis, this star never existed, despite the fact that I have a picture of it right there. Problem. Uh, today it looks like that. We've got these, you can see the expanding material as it, as it gets bigger and bigger every year as it expands out. You're seeing basically expanding star guts. What's left of that little star as it exploded and couldn't handle the pressure. And that gets a little bigger every year. Now, should we bother studying that? Because maybe it's not even real. Maybe it's just a picture that God made in a beam of light. It's problematic, isn't it? It's not a question of what God can do. Of course, God can do that. That's not the issue. The question is, would he? Is it consistent with his nature? That's, that's my problem with that. Um, if light and trans is true, none of these things actually existed. And you might say, well, I don't have a problem with that. I think God would create fictional images. Careful. Because how do you know I'm here right now? Yeah? <laughs> Well, we can see, well, yeah, but God made the beam of light one inch away from your eye. Well, we can hear you too, Dr. Lyle. That's okay. God made the sound one inch away from your ear. How do you know you're not a brain in a jar? And God's just feeding you all the the sensory input? 
This takes away from the reality of the universe that God has created. And I don't think it's necessary. I think we do have some better explanations. My colleague, uh, again, Russ Humphreys, pointed out that time dilation might solve the distant starlight problem. And the idea is that clocks can flow at different rates in different environments. I'm not going to get into details on that. I don't think it's ultimately the right answer, but it was a, it's a brilliant attempt, and he continues to work on that. And uh, it's, it's not a problem having competing models. That's what science is all about. We want to have, we want to have different competing models because eventually one of them wins out. The truth tends to surface when you have these competing ideas. But he hasn't been able to get the starlight here in 6,000 years in this model in terms of the rigors of the mathematics of it. What I think is the right answer involves the one-way speed of light the one-way speed of light. You've heard that the speed of light is constant in a vacuum, perhaps? That's true, but that's a round-trip speed. In other words, if I measured the speed of light on a round trip, I, I have a flashlight. Let's say we construct a very long hallway, and at one end we put a flashlight, and then the, the hallway is 186,000 miles long. We'll pretend we have government funding so we can do that. <laughs> and uh, we'll put a mirror on the other end of it. And when the clock strikes noon, we'll, we'll send out that light pulse, and of course it bounces off the mirror. And then when I see the return trip, um, I, I look at the clock, and I find that you would find that two seconds have elapsed. Light takes two seconds to go down that hallway, bounce off the mirror, and come back. That's a round trip. It goes there and back. Most people assume it took one second to go out and one second to come back. But in fact, we don't really know that. It could be the case, for example, that the light um, zips out quickly, maybe, maybe taking no time at all to get to the mirror, and it takes all of two seconds to come back. It could see, we'd see the same thing, because I'm standing over here by the, by the flashlight with my clock. I emit it at the same time, and I see the return trip at the same You can't tell. Or it could be the opposite. It could be that the light takes a long time to get out to the mirror, and then it travels back very slowly. And people say, well, why would they be different? And I don't really know, but I don't know why they would be the same either. Um, this direction and this direction are not the same direction. And there are, there are certain crystals where the speed of light is very different in one direction than another, just due to the way that the crystals aligned and so on. It could be that the vacuum of space is that way. It could be that light propagates through space this way at a different speed than that way. The point is we don't know. All we know is the round trip speed. And you say, well, fine, we'll just measure the one-way speed of light. How are you going to do that? It turns out it's hard really hard. We'll try, in order to do the one-way speed of light, you can't use a mirror anymore because we ju we're going to do just a one-way trip. So you have one clock over here, one clock over there. You send the pulse out. When this one hits noon, and it hits there, and you read the time, and you're thinking it's probably one second after 12, right? Well, I tried this in my office. I did. My watch hit noon. As soon as it hit noon, I turned on the light just for a split second. And as soon as I saw the reflection off the phone, I got a clock over there by my phone. And as soon as I saw the reflection of that, I read the time. It said 12.05. And I said, uh-huh, light takes five minutes to get from my... What? Oh, no? You don't believe me? Did I make an assumption that maybe is not correct? See, this kind of experiment would only work if these clocks are synchronized. Now, it happens that the clock on my desk is five minutes fast. You see? And so, of course, I'm going to get the wrong answer. And since we're dealing with light, something that's very fast, these two clocks have to be exactly synchronized. You say, no problem, we'll just synchronize clocks that are separated by distance. Turns out that can't be done. Let me show you why. Most people, most of the time, we use a radio transmitter to synchronize clocks, at least approximately. But the problem is, you know, so there's a radio transmitter station in Fort Collins. In fact, my watch sets it to that. It receives a radio pulse and resets it to get the exact time every night. It's kind of neat. Never have to set it that way. Um, but the radio pulse takes a little bit of time to get from one clock to the other, doesn't it? Well, and so it, if, I, if it, when this one hits noon, you send out the radio pulse, or, or then it goes over to the other one and it receives it. Um, okay, you, st you set it to noon, but wait a minute, it took a little bit of time. Should I set it maybe a little bit forward of noon? How far forward? Well, how long does it take the radio pulse to travel? The problem is radio travels at the speed of light. And that's the very thing I'm trying to measure. <laughs> Can't be done. Some people have thought if you put the radio transmitter in the middle, that'll solve it. But it really doesn't. Because if, if light travels different speeds in different directions, then so does radio. And so the clocks would not be synchronized under that condition. Some people have said, well, we'll synchronize the clocks when they're together, and then we'll move one of them, or both of them, to the opposite ends of the hallway. And that seems really good, because it's no problem synchronizing when they're together. You can see they read the same time. But there's a problem. Motion affects the passage of time. According to Einstein, the very act of moving a clock causes it to become desynchronized. Now, the good news is there's an equation that tells you how much it's desynchronized. And so you could compensate for it and set it back. 
The bad news is, in that equation, is the speed of light. Isn't that interesting? It's like God doesn't want us to know the one-way speed of light. It's really interesting. So apparently, it's impossible to synchronize clocks without knowing the one-way speed of light. And it's impossible to measure the one-way speed of light without synchronized clocks. We're, just, we're stuck in a permanent catch-22. And I'm going to suggest that that means that this one-way speed of light is not actually a property of nature. It's, it's a convention, something that we get to make up. And that's counterintuitive. Because people are inclined to think, well, there, it's got a speed. We, if only God would whisper into our ear what it is. And I'm saying, no, it actually doesn't have, it's got a round trip speed that God sets. We get to choose the one-way speed, amazingly. And uh, I'm not the first to come up with that idea. The first to come up with the idea that the uh, speed of light being different or the same in different directions is something we get to choose and is in fact not a, um, what does he say, it is not a supposition nor a hypothesis about the physical nature of light, but a stipulation which I can make of my own free will in order to arrive at a definition of simultaneity. The person who came up with that was Albert Einstein. He realized that it's, that it's impossible to synchronize two clocks um, except by choosing the one-way speed of light, what you want it to be. And what that means is I can choose the one-way speed of light, if I want to, to be infinitely quick when it's toward me, as long as the return trip averages to C, which would be half, half C when it goes out. And it all works out. The, ma- the physics all works out. I wish I had more time to talk about that, but we're, um, I'm, getting, I'm actually out of time here, so I need to wrap things up. But my point is, if we use this convention, the distant starlight problem is solved, because the light doesn't have to go out to the galaxies and return. That would take billions of years. It only has to go one way. And that doesn't take any time at all if, you, if the Bible uses this, what's called an anisotropic synchrony convention. Anisotropic means different in different directions. And if the Bible uses this anisotropic or ask synchrony convention, then there is no distant starlight problem. God makes, makes the stars on day four and their light arrives on earth instantaneously, even today. So you're seeing the universe in real time if you choose this convention. The only issue is, does the Bible use that convention? And I think it does. One, it's the convention that all ancient cultures implicitly used. Two, I think it's suggested by Scripture in Genesis 1.14 and 1.15. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the light. Let them be for signs and for seasons and days and years. And then he says, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it says, and it was so. What was so? They gave light on the earth. Apparently, when God first spoke those stars into existence, they immediately began fulfilling their God-ordained role to give light upon the earth. It didn't take any time at all, and that implies the ask convention. So I think the scriptures are using that particular system. I don't think they're using Einstein's system, which wasn't invented until really the 20th century, but implicitly a little bit before that. I might be wrong about that, but it's a, it's a good model, and nobody's been able to refute it so far. And uh, we, we do have answers. That's the point I want you to understand. We do have answers. So the Bible is right when it talks about the glory of God being revealed in creation. The Bible is right when it talks about the basics of astronomy. The Bible is right when it talks about the age of the universe. The Bible is right when it talks about the uniqueness of the earth. And the Bible is right when it addresses distant starlight. In all matters, the Bible got it right. How about that? All right. Well, thank you very much. We're going to uh, set into a time of, of Q&A. Uh, uh, I, uh, I'd love for you to just tell us, tell us what, what got you interested in, in becoming an astrophysicist. Did you just wake up when you were three and said, this is it, I'm going to be an astrophysicist? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> my, uh, my dad was always interested in astronomy and his dad before him. They're just uh, something that the Lord's placed within me, perhaps genetically, apparently. And uh, I just always loved it. Even when I was a little kid, I just was fascinated by the scale and the beauty of the universe. And I remember going to our local library, which wasn't much, and uh, looking at all the, all the books on astronomy and just being fascinated with that. And then when I got to uh, probably uh, junior high or high school, I started using my dad's telescope to look at these things with my own eyes. And it's just a, it's a lot of fun. It's just a lot of fun. Wow. Well, we're going to get into some Q&A right here. My wife did receive a text while you were speaking, and you don't have to answer this question, but the question was, are, are you married? Because they were very interested in that. Uh, so I guess that just goes to show stars really are hot, aren't they? Oh, my. <laughs> I know that's a, that's a dad joke, but I'm a dad. I've got, I've got four kids. So let's just step into the, uh, the questions here. What is your favorite planet or galaxy? I'm real fond of Earth. Um, the best restaurants are here. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, second to Earth, Saturn's a delight. It, nothing looks like it, and it's just, uh, it's, it's just stunning to see Saturn with your own eyes through a telescope. Beautiful. I had a real good view of it just a few nights ago. Really pretty. And in your book, you show how someone with a telescope right. can find that. Is yeah, that right? that's right. Fantastic. And the next question that should come up on the screen, just, there we go. What are the rings of Saturn made from? They're made up of mostly icy materials. They're basically little moons, ice and rock, mostly ice at that distance. And they just orbit around Saturn, trillions of them. Uh, really kind of amazing. All the big planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they all have rings, actually. But Saturn's are the only one that are substantial enough that we can see them easily from Earth. I saw a picture uh, of scientists that, were, uh, that had been studying the moons of Saturn, and one of those moons uh, actually traveled through the rings and, and left uh, a, a really tremendous path. It was just fascinating to look at how these, these celestial bodies interact with one another. Yeah, there are, well, they're, they're called shepherding moons that are on either side of one of the, one of the ring systems, and they, prov- they keep the ring in place, just like, uh, you know, dogs keeping the sheep, sheep in their place. It's really interesting. And then there are other moons like um, uh, Mimas, for example, is one of the moons of Saturn that causes the Cassini division. It's actually not in the Cassini division, it's outside of it, but its, its orbital period is related to an object there, such that if there were a, an, an object in the Cassini division, it would pull on it and pull it out. Wow. And so it actually causes that gap. And I think I remember reading that Saturn is made up of, of many rings, in fact. Is that right? Saturn has many different rings. It's got three primary rings that you can see slight shade differences. And within them, there are very subtle gradations as well. They're yeah, really beautiful. Fascinating. Here's the next question. How does the depth of lunar dust explain a young Earth? Okay, that's a good question. Because it, it, at, a time, at a time ago, they thought maybe the uh, dust on the moon could be used as a good argument for a young uh, universe or young solar system, or at least a young moon. And we now think that's probably not a good argument to use. Uh, it was based on the, in, the rate at which dust accumulates on the moon. The problem is we don't really know what the rate at which dust accumulates on the moon is. Those early calculations, we think, were probably off by quite a bit. So it's, it's, it's not, the, the, the dust, the current amount of dust on the moon is neither a proof of old or young, but I think the recession of the moon is a very strong indicator of its youth. I think that's a very good argument. Very interesting. Who decided that Pluto was no longer a major planet, and why, after all this time, did it change? The, the, uh, the people responsible for this, if you want to write them hate mail, are the, uh, <laughs> the International, what is it, the International Astronomical uh, Union, and they voted on it, basically. But it had been a long time coming, because when Pluto, when Pluto was first discovered, they thought it was maybe as big as Mars, pretty substantial. And uh, it's hard to tell because you can't see any size to Pluto. I've seen Pluto in a telescope, and it is a speck. There's not much to it. And so you have to make a guess about how big it is based on how bright it is. But that, de- that also depends not only on size, but how bright the surface is. And it turns out Pluto's surface is a lot brighter than they originally thought, and therefore its size is much smaller. It's smaller than the moon. And so it's not a very big world at all. And... Uh, what, what forced the issue was we started finding other objects about the same size as Pluto in, in roughly the same position, hundreds of them. And one of them was bigger. And so either we'd have to, in, in fairness, we'd either have to add a new planet and perhaps hundreds of them or demote Pluto. And Pluto got booted. And it's not the first time that happened. When the first asteroids were discovered, they were classified as planets until we realized there are 7,000 plus asteroids. And so after they started finding many of them, they thought, this is a new class of object, a lot smaller than planet. Let's call it something else. Let's call them asteroids. And so Pluto has now been demoted to a dwarf planet or a uh, trans-Neptunian object. I guess we'll have to send Pluto through our freedom classes on identity. That'll help it. (laughs) How many Earths would make up the mass of one red supergiant? A lot. And I, <laughs> I don't know the, the answer offhand because uh, the mass of a red supergiant, it would be enormous. It'd be enormous because the mass of a supergiant is much greater than the mass of the sun. And the sun is much greater than the mass of the Earth. In terms of uh, volume, the sun could hold a million Earths. Now, it's not quite as dense as the Earth is, but uh, it'd be something along that order. And then multiply that again by millions. It would be enor- it's an enormous difference. That's, I mean, we're getting into astronomical numbers, thing, yeah. numbers that we can't even put figures to. Can That's right. We? It's amazing. How do you address the question that if we discover intelligent alien life, it would disprove the Bible? I, first of all, I don't, think, I don't think it would because the Bible doesn't explicitly say that there isn't intelligent life out in space. But frankly, I don't expect that to happen. So uh, that's, that's my challenge to the evolutionists is where are they? 
you know, you're the ones that predict this. And so far, the evidence has been completely consistent with my understanding of Scripture, which is that the earth is special and unique and alone designed to be inhabited. I could make a joke about intelligent life here on earth right now, but I'll move on. <laughs> what do you say to Christians who believe in the Big Bang? I would challenge them to look at the scriptures a little more carefully and say you don't really need to compromise with the world. The Big Bang really is a secular attempt to explain the universe apart from God. And so it's, you're missing the point if you think God caused the Big Bang. You're missing the point. And secondly, it's contrary to what God has said in the scriptures about the way in which he created the universe. The order of events in the Big Bang is different than what the scriptures teach. The Big Bang has uh, stars billions of years before the earth. The Bible has the earth made before the stars. The, the order of events is different. Earth, is, earth starts in, as water in the, in the biblical view and then is perfected and made into a paradise. According to the Big Bang model, it starts as a molten blob. It's, the order of events is different. The way in which creation happens is different. Basically, you have to make a decision about who you're really going to trust. Are you going to trust the secularists who weren't there, don't really know how the universe started, uh, make mistakes, don't know everything, or are you going to trust God who was there, who actually made the universe responsible for it, and so on? I say trust God. We'll do two more questions. Are black holes real, and if so, where are they? I do think black holes are real. Black holes are something that Einstein predicted as a consequence of his general theory of relativity, which has been vindicated in many ways. They're a region of space where the, the gravity is so intense that even light can't escape from it. And since nothing's faster than light, nothing can escape from a black hole once it's inside. So it's not a place you want to go visit. But um, I do think they're real. And uh, there, there's evidence for this because, for one thing, we find stars that orbit around an invisible companion. And I've even looked at stars that, that do that. It's really interesting. And so that suggests that, the, that there are, in fact, these uh, dark stars out there. And uh, their purpose might be as gravitational anchors. Um, where are they? They're, they're just, there's none close to Earth, so you can be happy to know that. God's placed them out in, in distances in space where we're perfectly safe from them. Uh, they, there's nothing magical about a black hole that causes it to suck things in like people think. If we could compress the sun into a black hole, the earth would continue to orbit around it as usual. It's only when things get really close that the physics gets strange. So they're perfectly safe, they're an interesting test of physics, and they're out in deep space, uh, nowhere nearby. And we'll make this our last question. What is, gap, uh, excuse me, what is the gap theory, and how does it fit in Genesis? The gap theory is an attempt to... Uh, line up scripture with the secular concept of billions of years, basically. And it does that by, saying, by postulating that there's an enormous gap of time in between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And so the gap theorists would say, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and they'd like to translate verse 2, and the earth became without form and void billions of years later. But it really can't be translated that way based on the way it's, it's worded in Hebrew. Verse 2 uses a Hebrew construction called a vav disjunctive, which is kind of like what we'd use parentheses for in English. Verse 2 is a comment on verse 1, describing the conditions of the earth when it was first created. So the gap theory does not stand up to rational scrutiny. Uh, Jesus certainly didn't hold to it because he says that God made them, referring to Adam and Eve, from the beginning of creation, not billions of years after creation. So Jesus believed in a young universe. We can demonstrate that from scriptures. 